So we will begin today's webinar uh, by introducing Jim Raffle of Colormetrics Technologies. Uh, he'll be here today to share his product called ProofPath.com. Uh, Colormetrics Technologies is partnering with us in our partner webinar series to discuss uh, new products or services that are available uh, for Roland users to help improve your workflow. So without further ado, I will hand the mic and control of the screen over to Jim, and Jim can start telling you about ProofPass.com. Jim, take right, it away. Dana, thank you very, thank you very much, Dana. And uh, if everything has worked correctly, I should be showing a PowerPoint presentation. If you're seeing that, Dana, just let me know. Mm -hmm. Yep, I see it. Okay, I got, I got the right screen. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just going to jump into this. I've got a few slides to run through. And we'll ask you a couple what are called poll questions during this presentation portion, just to get a little better understanding of people's knowledge levels so that we can tailor the presentation as we go. And then we'll jump into an actual demonstration of our ProofPaths.com package. So what is process control is really the first question that many people ask. And we're going to answer that. We're going to say, we're going to explain what it is, why you do it, and who, who engages in process control. We're going to cover what an industry term Delta E is. We're going to talk about industry standards and specifications, and then brand color verification. And that's all in this presentation, which we should get through in about 10 minutes or so. So what is process control? It's the collection of data. And in our case, we're going to be collecting color data. It's an analysis of that data. Because once you analyze the data, you then have the ability to do what we say is speak with data. So instead of pointing fingers and saying, that image is too warm, that image is too cold, that image is too red. We actually say that image is too red, but it's also too delta E too red. So we start to use numbers and attach actual facts to um, subjective feelings. And that, then, of course, the last thing is we act the data, and that, that gets into the troubleshooting aspect, more of which we'll talk about in the actual demonstration. So why do we engage in process control? Well, if we look at this, this chart, which you think of it as a uh, bullseye with a bow and arrow or a BB gun that you might have done as a boy or girl scout. The, the ultimate goal is to be both accurate and precise. So let's think about brand colors. And you're, you're working for, say, a soft drink manufacturer who has a particular red that you're trying to achieve. Ultimately, they are going to be most satisfied when you are both accurate and precise. But there are other instances that will look good but perhaps aren't as good ultimately. And that's precise but not accurate. So we're still hitting a very tight cluster. We're hitting the same color repeatedly. Unfortunately, it's a little far from the color that our customer desires. And the other uh, aspect would be accurate but not precise. And in that case, we're close to the brand color, but we're not quite close enough because the customer wants us here. So it's an understanding of these two things that will help in the troubleshooting aspect as we go on. Who uses process control? I, I actually love to jump to Starbucks, but I'm going to do it last because otherwise I'll skip all the other ones. It's pretty much anyone who manufactures processes, uh, products or processes, actually, and wants to maintain consistency over time. Roland, I'm sure, engages in process control to manufacture your, your Roland printer if you have one. Um, in the graphic arts, screen printers have been doing this for years, offset printers, photo processing has led the, led the charge in this uh, for anyone who came from the photo industry. And then I, I love the Starbucks example because the reason your cup of Starbucks tastes exactly the same in Milwaukee, where I live, or in California, where Dana lives, is because Starbucks is meticulous about making sure that every step of their process is in control, that their re reverse osmosis system works. And so love them or hate them, it's the same cup of coffee anywhere you drink it. What are the benefits of process control? You can get consistent colors on your repeat jobs. You can basically use different medias. So you could use um, a car wrap media or a signage media and match the same color on both of those, again, thinking brand colors. It, it's a means of documentation. What has my printer been doing since the day I bought it? Because you can have a, a run chart, which we'll show you later, that shows if it was able to produce the same color over time. Ultimately, it will lower cost because it'll, it will eliminate reprints due to color shifts. And Ideally, it will create higher, higher quality prints, which should allow you to command a higher uh, price in the marketplace. 
Um, before I ask, ask this question, Dana, could you throw out the Delta E poll just so we can get an idea of our Delta E knowledge in the group? I'm going to run the Delta E Dana. poll right now. Okay. So, are you familiar with the term Delta E? And the results suggest that well, the majority of you are not familiar with the term Delta E, and then a small percentage of you are. So roughly a, a third of the respondents have some familiarity with it, Jim, but the uh, vast majority of our presentation seminar today do not. Okay, great. I'm glad I asked the question because I can spend a little more time on this section. What I'm displaying on the screen now is an image which we have intentionally created a delta E shift. And delta E is simply a numeric way to communicate color difference. And uh, I actually noticed one of my, my friends is on this webinar, and he could Dave Hunter could do um, hours on delta E and color difference, but I'm going to try and do it in less than five minutes. So this was one print, which we printed twice, and then you know, the big poster size image, which might be hard to tell here. And then we cut it into pieces. And it doesn't matter which one it is, but these three pieces are printed to one color spec, and these three are printed to another color spec. And they're almost 20 delta E apart. That's a very, very big difference. That's why we can see it. But you even notice, knowing it's 20 delta E, some up here in our grays, it's fairly easy to see. If you go from a light gray to a dark gray, Unless you really have a well-trained color eye, it might, you might not see it quite as much here in the red crossover. I mean, it, it's definitely different. Um, but I'm trying to remember which piece. I guess actually it's this piece, which is the same. So these two should be the same reds, and they are not. Let's talk about that. So delta is a single number that represents the difference between two colors. And if we have a delta E of between 1 and 2, that's that's it approximately the smallest color difference that the average person can see. And when I say average, I'm talking average person who works with color on a rather regular basis. So delta E is used to determine how much of a, a device has drifted or just how different two, two prints are. It might be a different media that's causing the color difference. And it also allows you, if you're using color profiles, to determine the effectiveness of that profile for printing or proofing. We'll get into that in a little more. So I'm going to intersperse some more Delta E education throughout this presentation, knowing that about two-thirds of you uh, are not familiar with the term. But just understand it's a way to numerically represent color difference. So one of the, the things that might happen, and actually before we do this slide, I think I'm going to go to poll question two, Dana, which is familiarity with these terms. OK, so we'll open up our polls again. It might be. Uh, have your customers ever asked you to print to an industry specification like Grackle, Swap, or First? Okay, I'll go ahead and close the poll. Uh, and it looks like uh, the vast majority, again, three quarters would say no. But that is, however, pretty much what I kind of expected. Um, I thought more. I thought the delta E number would be closer to 50-50, but this kind of explains why. So what's happening is these industry standards that were actually developed for industries, let's just say, outside of um, the inkjet, uh, large format, sign, vehicle wrap, are starting to creep into the inkjet and sign market, vehicle wrap market. And that's because as more and more big brands who kind of drive these initiatives are demanding that the vehicles that are wrapped with their, with their colors match the package that's inside the vehicle that matches the can that's inside the package. Well, the way that those things are achieved in many aspects are by following things like Grackle, Swap, and First. Again, this, this is not a presentation about these industry standards. These are, these are terms you might want to Google later on and, and learn about because, as you, as you saw in the poll, 25% of your peers are being asked to produce to these specifications, and, and my my thought is that that number will grow. If we did this webinar a year from now, it might be approaching 50%, or it would at least be more than 25. It might be 35 to 40. So it's going to continue to become more and more of a factor. One of the things that we do is we produce a, a target that looks like this on our prints. And this is what we're going to be measuring later. So we'll sit here for a minute. There's 54 color patches on this. We produce this uh, through, the, through our rep, and then we'll measure it with an instrument like an I-1. 
and then once we've measured it, that's where we can get into the process control and the verification of color. Now that would be for our four color or for our you know our, our overall color and appearance, and then we're going to talk about spot colors also in a minute. That's a different approach. So the other aspect of this is going to be um, brand colors, and before I talk about brand colors too much, I don't know again how many of you use profiles, and I don't have a poll question for that because it's, we have to talk about it whether you have to use them or not. In order to accurately hit brand colors over time consistently, you're going to need to use an ICC profile. Again, that's not something Color Metrics does, but I think you need an understanding of that to understand parts of this presentation as we go on. The, the profile basically is a calibration of a particular media, particular printer, particular ink set in a particular environment. So that would be your highest level profile. So you actually make it on your printer in your shop with your media and ink. Some people use can, what they call CAN profiles, and there's different levels of CAN profiles. Some are provided by media companies, so it's it's the Grackle standard on their media, but not necessarily a specific printer. Some manufacturers provide, provide CAN profiles that would be the, the printer type, the right model and, and media, but not your exact physical printer with your serial number. So most profiles, though, not most, all profiles are really only valid for the, the mode of resolution that it was made for. So Ultimately, making your own profiles is, is typically the best solution. So I'll talk enough about profiles. Except to say that the reason you want a profile is that every printer in every environment is a little bit different, and only a custom profile for your printer and your media is going to give you optimal output. And if you're trying to hit very, very close brand colors, you're going to need that kind of control. Um, the, the other thing that happens is every printer, every ink set with every media combination creates a color gamut. And a color gamut is just how many colors you're capable of producing. So a brand color that's produced on a printer may not match a swatch book, so it's a Pantone swatch book, um, because it's not achievable on your printer. It's out of gamut. That's becoming less and less of a problem as the, as the ink sets change, but there are still colors in the Pantone book that can't be hit on some printers. There are some brand colors that can't be hit on inkjet printers that, aren't, that don't even have a Pantone number. So what you need to do is essentially produce a test chart on your printer after you've created the appropriate ICC profile, and then see if those colors, either by measuring or by visual assessment, are within your gamut. And then you let your customers pick from an approved color palette that was produced on your printer, and it's always achievable. All right, and before we, why don't we do the brand color uh, question or poll question now, Dana, now that they've got a little background on what we're talking about. Okay. The poll is... How frequently do you produce specified brand colors? As in, when the customer brings their company information and their logo into your shop, how often do they ask you, can you hit this? Okay, so uh, almost half of you on a weekly basis are required to reproduce brand colors. So, and what I'm going to tell the, the portion of that uh, well, let's just say the, what is it, almost 80, almost 90% of you that have to produce brand colors, a big percentage of you aren't yet familiar with the term Delta E, and I would say that you made an excellent choice participating in this webinar for no other reason than to learn a little more about Delta E, because Delta E is one of the ways that you can ensure not only yourself, but your client that you're actually hitting that brand color. It's one thing to visually assess it, it's another thing to measure it, and then when you're having trouble hitting it, to measure it and be able to actually um, determine why you're not able to hit that brand color. So I, I, I really am glad we did that poll, Dana, because it's going you know, to really allow me to focus this more, more tightly. So brand color replacement, many RIPs, and I don't, because I'm sure you're using all kinds of different RIPs, but many RIPs allow um, essentially a brand color or a spot color replacement table. And I think it's just important that you know that, because once you've taken the time to create the, the correct profile and you know what brand colors you're trying to hit, there are ways in RIPs, and it's different from RIP to RIP, and some RIPs won't even do it that you can say whenever you see this color number or this color name, produce it this way um, as long as you're using this profile. And it's, it's just another way to ensure that you're going to be uh, hitting the correct brand color for your client and not having to do a replant. So what we're going to do is we're going to start shifting now into the, the actual demonstration of the ProofPass product to show you how you can initially set up your process control using the ISO control strip, which we showed earlier, the two strips of color bars. And we do that with ProofPass in two ways. ProofPass is what we call a client server application. So 
there's a piece of client software which you're going to see, actually because I ran into some technical problems, you're going to see running in a Mac window, and then you're going to see the server side or the web piece running on my PC, which is just a way of also showing that you can run this on a Mac or a PC. It doesn't really matter. And the neat thing about ProofPass is it's software-based, so you can get a pass or fail uh, on the entire strip when necessary. You can create virtually an unlimited number of baselines. So if you think of all the different ink, not really ink, but all the media combinations and resolution combinations that you utilize on a daily or weekly basis, you can create a baseline for each of those. And before you produce an expensive print on an expensive media, you can run a very quick test and say, are we in spec? Yes, we are in spec. OK, let's print. So you don't find out when the whole print is done or halfway done that you aren't hitting color. And, th and there's online troubleshooting resources, really in the sense that you can look at the numbers and understand what they mean. So this, this is what the web side of it looks like. And essentially, we're going to do this. We're going to do an actual demo, so I won't spend too much time. But this is one of our detail screens where we drill down. It just shows us the control strip. It shows us some delta E numbers. I've got them almost up to zero there. It shows us our delta E difference. It shows us how close we are to hitting a specific color. And we'll drill into all of these things in greater detail in just a second. So I'm going to actually do this. Okay. I want to grab a little Where's my server side? I'm actually going to log out. So Dana, while I get ready to do this piece, let's, let's ask the last poll question, which I think is, do you have a color measuring instrument like an I-1? OK. We will launch that poll right now. Uh, do you own a color measuring instrument such as an X-ray I-1 or a spectrophotometer? OK, so it looks like uh, 3 quarters don't have a spectrophotometer. OK, so that. That infers, I, have, I guess I have to infer that the people doing brand color management on a frequent basis are doing it with visual, most, most of them. Um, Dana, I guess one question I never asked is, can I, can I play this YouTube video and will, it, will they get the audio or not? Uh, they may get the audio, they may not, but they'll see it. So it's worth All a right, try. Which is fine, because I can, I can talk them through it, and if they aren't getting the audio, I'll, I'll, I'll hit the highlights. So this, this video is less than two minutes, and it's a, a broad overview of ProofPass. The only reason I'm playing this video so everyone understands it, because you obviously get on a webinar to watch a video, is it does. there is, uh, in this video, a couple spots where you get to see the I-1 instrument. And I think it's important that you understand that piece of it. So I'll just start it up. Um, which you may do, I guess you may end up hearing. Well, I'm, I'm hearing it. And there's, there's the I-1. We'll, we'll get a better shot of it here in a second. Oh, I see what it's doing. I'm not getting any audio, Jim. They're not getting the audio? OK. What I'm going to actually do is go back. I'm just going to pause this. Since they're not getting the audio, there's, there's the, I just wanted them to see the I1, actually. There it is. Let's see if I can get a clear shot of the I1. OK. So there's, there's what, oh. <laughs> I apologize, folks. There's what the I1 looks like. And you, you can't see my, I guess I have to stop moving this. There's what the I-1 looks like, and you can actually, you've seen it probably, scan back and forth. So there's a ruler, and this is actually exactly the target I'm going to be measuring. And you essentially press the button on the side of the I-1, and then you slide it across, and you take the measurement. I just I wanted people to see what that is. It's also capable of taking a single spot measurement, like a conventional densitometer or spectrophotometer. So again, for those of you doing uh, any brand color uh, printing and having any trouble hitting those colors, this is a relatively inexpensive device. I, I don't know what X-ray sells them for now. We don't sell them, but I, I think it's right around a thousand dollars. You can get. Jim, we have we have X-ray packages in our online store, mm -hmm. so I can reference that at the end of the webinar today. Perfect, perfect. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. So this is the website, and before we show you the website, I'm going to show you the client side. So this is the proof pass client. And again, this would run on a Mac or a PC. And I, what I did before this webinar is I created. 
I created two data sets for, for the Roland Dem Academy demo. The first one is what we, the control strip we call the ISO 12647-7 control strip. And that's the one that I, I mentioned before. And, and when I set it up on my website, I said that we're printing on a proofing paper. There's no post print coding, inkjet, uh, and it's for the Roland demo. So the next thing you would see is an actual visual representation of the strip that we're supposed to measure. And I'm actually going uh, to say uh, first live demo measurement, just to show you that you can, in fact, tag each measurement for, for later reference. And then I'm going to line up my I1 with the ruler, just like you saw, hopefully saw, at least a little bit in the video. And I'm going to scan the top row of the control strip. I apologize. Let me have it still set up to take single measurements, which we're going to do in a minute when we do our spot color demo. As I said, the instrument's capable of scanning or taking single measurements. So now I just scan that entire row. And I'm going to the second row. I'm going to press the button. So in this case, I did fail. And I, I intentionally picked one that failed because I think it's much more useful to have an example with a failure. And I know that I'm failing in this particular slot right here, the one that's outlined in red. What I can do is there's, there's a, a label view. Oh, and it's over here. Let me drag it under the screen. You guys can see. So there's the label view. And it does show me that I failed. Now, the label has a limited amount of swatches that it can display. And I happen to know that these, these first four, B23 through 26, are uh, three color gray overprints. And then these are your CMYK solid overprints. So those are all good. And our gray balance is, relatively speaking, good. And we can get these delta E numbers. So again, if we talk about delta E real briefly, this A2, which is uh, A2 is the cyan solid uh, ink swatch, is two, two and a half delta E away from the specified solid cyan, that, that, and this happens to be Grackle. So we're running to the that Grackle standard I mentioned earlier. If, we were, if our client had said you need to print to the Grackle 2008 standard, in this case, based upon tolerances we've set up, and we'll get into that in a moment, we would actually have to remake this proof. So because it looks like, um, I think that's actually a media failure right there. That's, I believe that's the media swatch. It is. So in this case, the media, and that's, that's kind of a neat thing with troubleshooting. If I know that's the media swatch, and you've been using this for a while, you would know that, oh, maybe we just have the wrong media loaded, or maybe this batch of media has a problem. So the next thing we can do if we need more in-depth troubleshooting, which normally when you have a failure, you do, we click Next, and what that does is send those results back to the web. We log into the web with our credentials. And it shows us the most recent set of measurements that we've taken. So here's the Roland Academy demo, first live demo that I just measured. Click on that one. This is just a broad overview screen. Um, it gives us our kind of our overall delta E. And we're, there's multiple ways to calculate delta E. For now, just look, since we, we're new with, with delta E, let's focus on the most commonly used one today, which is something called CIE 2000. And in that case, we're, we're peaking out at 5.31. That's a fairly big visual difference. That, that gets into the realm of almost anybody being able to see it if you held the two pieces next to each other. There's a bunch of printer-friendly reports, which we're going to skip over for now. I talked about the process control aspect of this. What I did earlier this morning before this demo is I have a stack of about four or five proofs here. And I just measured them repeatedly. If I, if I hover over them, you can see that this is my print one. Is my print two, my print three, print four, and then back to print one, print two. So you can kind of see why, why we're going up and down here, and it should be consistent. But the one we just measured, if I hover over it, we get, again, that same max delta E, and we get the description down here in, in the corner. If I want to know more about it, if I want to understand why that paper or the, the substrate swatch failed, I can go in, I can drill very, very quickly down into the very deep detail. And what I do is I click on the word delta E. And, when, and again, remember, delta E is the color difference. So I want to sort it. I want the worst ones at the top. I want to know what the very worst delta E is so I can understand what needs to be fixed. Well, in this case, B20, which is a zero, that means it's paper, is a 5.3 delta E. 
So for some reason, this, this media is different than the media that we're supposed to be using when we print graphical. And it's different enough that in this particular case we would have failed. And we can also trend here. We can trend the delta E of just the media. And if you remember correctly, remember I said I read sample one, sample two, sample three, sample four. Those so these three are always in spec. But sample one is back out of spec two, three, four. This, this is kind of a, a strange run chart. You normally wouldn't have something this consistent, but at least you can see how the run chart would show you over time, my client wants me to have five or less delta E, and that means I want to see this line down under that red area at all times. Now one of the neat things about proof paths is you can decide what the what the specifications are that you're running to. So if we click on the maintenance tab, and we go in and we edit the, the tolerances, so that's the that's that plus minus range that you are going to allow. You can see that right now we have it set to a global of five. Well, maybe you've determined over time that your media sometimes does vary by more than five, but you saw that even though the media was varying by more than five our actual colors that we were reproducing were under the five that our customer might have specified. So you can go in and you can say, no, you know what, from now on, we're going to let paper run to a six. And then if we go back in and view that same sample and go back to swatches, now it's still 5.3 delta E, but it's a pass. And, and it's not like you're lying to anyone. It tells them that, it's, that you're going to within six. We've also, again, because we're talking about LAV and delta E, which I think might be relatively new terms for, for about three quarters of us, the, think of the color space as a basketball. And as we go from the bottom of the basketball, it's very dark. When we go to the top of the basketball, it's very white. If we go from the left side of the basketball as we look at it, it's green to red, or magenta. And from what, what we're looking at to the back, it goes from blue to orange. And then that entire sphere is the color space where all the colors that your printer is capable of producing live. So hopefully that helps people understand what the, the color space itself. And then delta E is a measure of how far apart any two colors in this space are. So because brand colors seem to be something that 75% of you, or no, almost 90% of you have to do on a regular basis, what I'm going to do so I'm going to jump back over to my proof pass client application. And you may have noticed that I had a second data set, and I called it my spot color demo. You'll also notice that the, the control strip is far simpler and less, less uh, overwhelming to look at. And I'm just going to remeasure. I, I happen to have a Pantone book here. I'm going to remeasure this swatch. find my book here. I need to put my instrument back in single measurement mode. And so I'm going to now use my I1 in a single mode, and I'm just going to take a quick measurement of that brand color. So if you were trying to produce that brand color for a client, again, you could have a very small test print that just had that color on it that you would run that would use very little media, very little ink, take very little time. And of course, you'd run it through the right profile. You take a quick measurement like I, would, I just did, and you'd go, oh, OK. We're safe to run this client work now for the next three hours and, and several rolls of media. And hopefully, you know, not, not hopefully, now we know that it's going to come out all right. Now, some people might even pause in between and take additional measurements. But we have, we have assurance here that, no, let me drag this over. This is a different form. See, now we're printing to our own in-house standards. So I measured the book. I said the book is the reference. And this is the color I want to hit. So it's very simple. It's just saying, this is my roll and demo. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to measure it as a uh, as a Pantone. And again, I type that description in, and um, it's demo measurement. So again, it, it displays these pieces of information that we type in right here. It displays on our label, and there's actually ways if you want to allow your client uh, access to this data, you can provide that to them. But that's a that could be a whole different webinar. So then we can click Next, and we can send that data back to the web server. 
And now in our summary list, this spot color is the first item on the list. And when we go to the swatches, there's only one. But we can see that we were trying to hit a reference. So this is my original measurement, and this is my second measurement. And that, by the way, you're going, you measure the same book. If anyone's seen a Pantone book, those swatches are about two, maybe two, two and a half inches wide and inch high. But yes, they actually do it. There's, there's two things. There's variation in the printing across that strip, that, that swatch. And there's variation. The instrument does have some variation in it for every measurement. So to expect a zero delta E is completely unreasonable. Um, if you have clients asking for anything less than a three delta E, I would argue that that, that borders on unreasonable. Uh, so the, 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 the range of delta E, as I said, one to two is where certain colors become visual. Honestly, most colors for consumer product production, somewhere around two and a half to three is where they actually become visually perceptible to, to your average person. And I think some people would say that number is even higher. So again, I won't, I won't throw too much into these numbers, but again, these are the LAB numbers that generate the delta E. And you can see this is a very small delta E, so the L, A, and B, and again, that was the, oh, there. remember the L goes from bottom to top, the A goes from left to right, and the B goes from front to back. So let's, for fun, go back to our summary. And I'm going to look at the sample previous to this, and I can, I can do another measurement, but I also then measured just the red overprint on one of my inkjet proofs that I had in front of me. And you can see there we have a 4.4 delta E difference. And again, it's not enough to see on, at least on my monitor, it may be showing up more, but this left-hand box is the actual Pantone book, the right-hand box is the, um, the proof that I measured, and these are rendered as closely as they can be on your monitor, and that gets into the whole issue of how accurate your monitor is. Oh, it is. But what's more important is, so we have a 4.4 delta E now, and now you can see, let me open up that window again, now you can see that the L has varied by about one unit, so it means, and the L got less, so it, when L is smaller, it means darker, because an L of zero is, is black and an L of 100 is white, so when we go from 48 to 47, it means we're printing this, this red to light, and it went from an, an A of 70 to an A of 67. So it actually moved away from red towards gray. So it's not even quite the right intensity. It's not the right intensity of red. And then the B, 67, well, that, that was a, a big move, too. That's almost 10. So the color kind of moved from probably over here to over here. And you can see why it would no longer be within the spec that the client had, had, had uh, requested. show you how that would work. We'll go back into the client again briefly. I want to take another spot measurement just so you can see how that looks when it fails. And again, I'm just going to find a red overprint on one of my proofs. Because typically that's the way you would be trying to produce this color. You're not going to, you're not going to have, unlike an offset printer, you can have a spot color mixed. You have to produce it as a, as a, as a blend of CMYK. Um, or a build of CMYK, and a red overprint is relatively close to, a, a, to this color that I'm trying to achieve, which is a 45 red. So in this case, we got the failure. Let's transmit that one back. And let's look at the trend line. So it shows us that the, the book, the original book, which we set as our reference, zero delta E from itself, that's good. The first proof that I measured earlier today had it almost four and a half, four point five. When I remeasured the book, it was less than a half delta E apart. And then when I measured this additional proof, it's back up to around four delta E. So this is the kind of report that you and you can actually use a friendly version of this report. So this is the kind of report that depending on the results, you could produce and send along with your job if your client is asking for documentation. But it's also an internal tool for you to understand how well are we producing this brand color over time. Dana, where did you, oh, I'm, so we've had no questions in the question box yet? Doesn't look like? No, not yet. Okay. okay. Well, I'm getting close to the um, allotted time for the actual demonstration. So. 
I, uh, if anyone has specific questions about proof paths, now would be the time to enter those in the question box so that I can address any specific needs. Otherwise, I've got a few features I'm going to dive into just so people understand things as we go forward. ProofPass has a, a built-in support page. And one of the neat things about ProofPass, if you're a brand new user, now that you've seen how it works, if you're a brand new user, you actually start up and the first, you basically are emailed. You enter your email address and your uh, name on that front ProofPass screen. And then the first time you log in, it asks you if you're going to install your software, which is what I, that's the client software, to a Mac or a PC. And if it's, if it's a PC, it, it takes you right through the installation process. And then once you've got the software installed, it will tell you how to measure, which is some of the things you've seen here today. And it also gives you some tips on how to review your data. I'm going to exit back out of the wizard. And you can see I can get back into the wizard anytime I want to see that information again. We also have a, the frequently asked questions as, um, Hi, Dan. <laughs> we also have frequently asked questions, uh, which basically explain how to do some things that are uh, common questions that we get both emailed in and on the phone for support. And yes, we do offer telephone support, which many software as a service companies do not. Maintenance is where you create your data sets. And I'm going to just show you what that page looks like. So in create data set, you notice that I had one that was named Roland, slot color, and then I had a description in the media. And then there's all kinds of different color bars, but really, for the most part, this ISO bar right here and the spot color bar are what most people in the inkjet world are using. So this, I would have basically just selected the spot color bar, and then when I created the data set, I was done. And so the, the data set exists both on the server and in the client software. And a question. Can you show the density and dots of tips? I can, uh, I think. I'm not sure I have one of my clients asked if I can show density and dot gain, and the answer might be a maybe. Let me see. I don't think I'm going to get any dot gain data. So density and dot are really more traditional print terms. Uh, my answer actually, Dan, is I cannot, but uh, I can with different data when I'm logged in a different way. So if you want to... Uh, reach out to me. I can, I can set up a, a webinar for you guys. Um, in the maintenance, that's where you create your data sets. That's also where you can go in and change the tolerances, which I showed you before, but oh, that's not what I want to really go into. Hey guys. Let's find one of our Roland spot color. An easy one to explain. So this is where we can give the spot color its name. And then we can also tell what our delta E tolerance is going to be. And that typically your, your client would probably specify that information to you. You can also create what are called filters. And I'll just give a real brief demonstration of that. What you may have noticed, if I put this to none, because I do lots and lots of demonstrations, I have a whole bunch of different data sets or print conditions. And then when I was doing the Roland demo, all you were seeing was the, were the ones I created for Roland. So it's just a way of filtering what, what my end user or measurement person would see. If you do choose to sign up for ProofPass, these are the account settings, things where you can put your own logo on the page. You can change your passwords, and there are multiple levels of passwords, which is a whole other webinar. Um, you, can, uh, you, can identify, you can modify your metadata labels, and just so you understand what those are. On this page right here, description and comments. You decide what those labels are. You can have one, two, three, five, ten, whatever you need to categorize your data. And we're getting close to the end of the webinar. We'll have a, a, I'm going to jump back into the PowerPoint, and I'm going to show you a coupon code. If you choose to take advantage of the free trial of ProofPass, which is good for 30 days, you can then click on this Renew Your Subscription. And the coupon code I'm going to provide for you will, if you enter it here, will lower this annual subscription fee from $597 to $497. So just for participating in this webinar, you can save $100 on your, on your first year subscription. And again, that's after your first 30 days, which are free. So let me bring back up that PowerPoint. I think. OK. So your exclusive code for having attended is just Roland and the number 12, all uppercase. Uh, again, though, you can just go to ProofPath.com, and by providing your 
email address and your name, you will be emailed a login and a password. And you can use ProofPass for free for 30 days. Uh, if you're planning to do that, but you don't already own your I1, you might want to acquire that. And, I, and Dana's going to explain how you can do that in a moment. Uh, and then and then sign up for the, the free trial so that you get the most out of the free trial. Uh, we also have a blog at, at colormetrics.com backslash blog where some of the you might be able to find more information on Delta E, um, LAB, and things of that nature. And you can also feel free to email me anytime, rafflej at colormetrics.com. That's also my direct line phone number, 262-314-4128, if you have questions after the webinar. Uh, Jim, for the benefit of those watching a recording of this webinar, today is the 21st of August. Is there an expiration date on this code? Yes, there is. Uh, it's set for... Um, the, the thirty, uh, the last day of next month. <laughs> okay. September. What is September? Thirty days. It's set to September thirtieth. Okay. So till till the end of September is when this is good for for the benefit of those of you watching this uh, as a recording. Right. And if for some reason you don't get signed up till the fifteenth or the twentieth, and you still you know you don't want to lose your thirty day free trial, just so you understand how our renewal process works. Essentially, that's a renewal of a free subscription. It adds 365 days to your existing subscription. So someone who knows they want to start with proof test today and they're already to go, sign up for the free trial, and if you pay today, you're good for 13 months. So, if you won't lose your 30-day free trial, the only thing you could lose is $100 if you don't do it before September 30th. I don't see any other questions in the question box. Is there anything else you think I should cover that I may have missed, Dana? I have a question here from Sean. Uh, he just started with the VersaCam this year. All of his work is done as heat onto garments. Uh, does this work for this type of media to get the colors right? So for decorated apparel, it's printed onto a substrate and then heat pressed onto a, uh, a garment or a piece of fabric. Would this still scan? Um, that applies to our decorated apparel customers who, who print onto a heat transfer material. Uh, my guess, and you can confirm or deny this, Jim, is you probably want to heat press it onto the garment itself before you scanned it, because that we're assuming uh, is the final representation of the color. Yeah, I've actually I've actually had a little bit of experience with this, and I I, I actually think it's a for for simplicity's sake, it's a combination of both things. I agree that you do need to heat transfer it onto the garment. But in an ideal world, you'd make two prints side by side, and you would heat transfer one onto the garment, because typically on the garment, you're going to probably have to put the instrument in a single measurement mode. You're going to have to, it's a very painstaking measurement process on a garment like that. Um, but if this is something you're producing time and time again, what you then do is, once you, if that passes, if that's the way you want it, actually, you only have to make two prints now, I think about it. You would measure, you'd measure it before the heat transfer with this in the scanning mode and save those values. Then you do your heat transfer and measure to see if the colors are correct once they're transferred. And now what you've got is you've got the, the untransferred correct colors and the transferred correct colors. Because typically, at least the couple of experiments I've done with this, and they're not many, it's much easier to measure it before it's heat transferred than after, if that makes any sense. But it's not the right color, obviously. So you have to know, you have to verify that it's the right color once transferred and then you can go back to the pre-transferred color and say, yes, this will transfer as, A will transfer as B. So, Sean, I hope that answers your question. There, there may be a slight color shift for the heat transfer process when the heat press actually clamps down onto the substrate. Uh, so it's important to get both measurements, the pre- and post-heat press colors. Right. So I hope that answers your question, Sean. At this point, uh, if you're done, Jim, we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, please type your questions in the question box, and Jim will address them. Okay, while we're uh, waiting for the question box to be addressed, Jim, are you finished with your slides? I am. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll take presentation back for now. Okay. And what I will show you uh, is our Roland DGA store. This is where we sell consumable items for the owners of our products. One of the things you can purchase from us here is the X-Rite i1 Basic Pro 2 or the X-Rite i1 Publish Pro 2. Uh, these are spectrophotometer packages from X-Rite. You'll see that right here in the bottom is the actual i1 itself. 
with a number of other tools available to you, a uh, sliding table, which would help for uh, scanning the prints that we went over today, as well as connections for profiling your monitor, uh, and of course a nice carrying case in case you have to move around or you want to be able to store it when you're not busy scanning it. So the difference as far as I can tell between the Basic Pro 2 and the i1 Publish is the inclusion of software for profiling. So these are color management tools that are available. Uh, it comes with the i1 Profiler software, which when used with the Spectro allows creation of ICC and ICM profiles. It also comes with Pantone Color Manager software. So this is a, a package available on our website, which works very well with ProofPass because it is an I1 spectra photometer made by X-Ray. And that's RolandDJStore.com. That's the exact, either one of those packages is good, and if they aren't already making profiles, the, the publish is a, is a good start. Yeah, it's highly, highly recommended that if you're interested in making custom profiles for your own media, uh, this would be a great asset to have at your disposal. So it looks like we're not getting any questions. Uh, I guess your presentation was spot on, Jim. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. Um, I will have this uh, presentation processed and posted up on the website, and I will have a recording given to uh, Jim for afterwards. We'll post it where you can view. And as Jim said, his Product code Roland12 uh, is available until the end of September. So if you have any parting words, Jim? I don't accept thank you. It was a pleasure to uh, share the information, and, and please reach out to us if you have any questions that come up after, after the webinar is complete. Okay. I want to thank you for joining Roland Academy Partner Webinar Series. Again, my name is Danny Curtis. I'm a product manager for Roland DGA Corporation. If you have any feedback for us, you can get us at academyfeedback at rolanddga.com. Thank you for joining us today. Have a good day, everybody.